Hey dreamers, and welcome to Dreamers Unite, the talk show for dreamers. I am your host, Sherry Pullum, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart for joining me today. I have a very special, special guest, and she is Becky Kroll. She is a soul artist, vibrational healer, writer who channels the divine. She recently closed her boutique gallery, Utopia, after 28 years of business, kudos to that, and is in the process of reimagining Utopia to include her passion to support the awakening of humanity. In 2018, she released her spiritual memoir, Bare Beauty, My Journey of Awakening, an intimate and honest revealing of her spiritual journey that offers a path to freedom, joy, and unconditional love. She has been creating art that comes from and speaks to the soul for over 30 years. So I bring you my soul sister friend, Becky. Thank you. Welcome to Dreaming Night. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. I am so honored to be able to be a part of your dream. Thank you. Because when you have a dream like this, it not only supports you in creating your dream, but it's a platform to support all of us in creating ours. Yeah. So what a beautiful thing. That to me is a form of sacred activism. And it is sacred. Dreams are sacred. They are sacred. Yeah. yeah. I want to jump in. I'm going to talk about, first of all, to start with your book, Bare Beauty, My Journey of Awakening. This book has so many aha moments in it, really. It certainly spoke to my soul, and I know it's probably speaking to women that are reading it. But first, what I want you to do is to define what does awakening mean to you? So, um, so for me, awakening is awakening to our inner being our soul self, our infinite, eternal, unlimited nature. And so when we awaken to that essence of who we are, then not only are we awakening to that inner being, we're awakening to that quality of being within everything and everyone else. So my experience of awakening is that we also become awakened to the oneness to the interconnectedness, to the interdependence that we have with each other and with life. And so um, my book, Awakening, um, Bare Beauty, My Journey of Awakening, is really that journey of those different points in my life where I experienced an awakening. So the way, if I can share this, um, the way that I, that I ended up writing this book, I've never wanted to write a book before, was not on my agenda. But I was walking in my beloved park, one of my favorite places to be. It's about five minutes from where I live. And there's paths through wooded area along marsh. And I was walking in the park and I heard the soundless voice whisper in my inner mind, you will write a book. And I have learned to listen to that voice. So I said, okay. And that day I got the download on what the thesis would be that the entire book would be guided through my divine guidance to support me and kind of leading me with each chapter. And so it was basically the thesis is to go back into my life from the beginning and just remember those points where I experienced an awakening. Mm. And so it was kind of a reliving of um, this amazing kind of re-embodiment of those moments of awakening because each time I would go back to it like the journey of awakening happened while I was even writing the book so each time I would go back to it I would be able to experience the embodiment of that sense of awakening that awareness mm -hmm. that opening that consciousness and so about halfway through the book I thought it was going to be this little little book on awakening, you know, maybe, you know, <laughs> I don't know, 100 pages at the most. It ended up being 300 pages. And 
But halfway through the book, um, I thought I was done. And the massacre at Mother Emanuel Church here in Charleston, which is where I live, occurred. And my heart just broke yeah. and opened. And a whole new kind of process of creating and writing emerged as a result of that huge contraction, that life contraction that so many of us in the country and certainly in my community experienced. And so from that point forward, about halfway through the book, it's real time awakenings that were happening in my mind. So there was a whole nother trajectory and this is the way the divine works. The divine leads that process. If you open and surrender and allow the divine to guide you, then it will lead the process that will heal you. Like the writing of the book was a part of my healing journey. And I share that, yeah. What place did you have to go to to be so honest, to be so truthful? And were you afraid to share a, your, because that is a bear, <laughs> it is bare and raw. Yeah. It is, it is. Um, while I was writing it, I was, tapping into the, that place of awakening, which is my divine guidance. So my inner being, um, my inner being, I think of as my soul. And so I was tapping into that frequency, but I was also reaching into what I call the infinite field of love and support. And that's somewhere I go when I paint, when I write, and when I do soul sessions with my clients as a vibrational healer. And what I've come to understand is that is called the Akashic field. And so I work within the Akashic field and through uh, sacred prayer, I'm able to kind of tap into that field and I feel it kind of ripple through me and I know I'm connected and then I speak mm -hmm. from that place. So in writing the book, it was effortless. It just flowed out of me. It was, it was, uh, it was I've been journal writing in the records for 30 years. And so this was very effortless. Now, when it came to publishing it, the process of editing and, yes. and rereading it and looking through it and organizing it and then getting it ready for, for the next level and knowing that it would be go out for others to read, yes. I definitely had some moments of, whoa, whoa, what was I thinking? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't thinking, and that's the key, is that when I was, when I create, I don't go into my mind. I go deep into a heart space. I go into the soul space. And soul is fearless, you know? It's, soul it's is not, fearless. Yeah, it's not, it's not um, holding back. And, and that that's really what it's about. That's why it's called bear beauty. It's about bearing our beauty. I'm bearing my personal beauty, which is that inner beauty, the divine self and the human journey that is not always so you know neat it's rather messy actually and so i do share those those messy experiences um and i call them my metaphor that i use in the book which i think is um it, it's such a great metaphor which is the metaphor of life labors i use birth as the metaphor so we are constantly moving through contractions in life and some of them are more subtle and you know easy to flow through and some of them will bring you to your knees yes they will and i have been brought to my knees quite a few times in my journey and i share those because those contractions are the very catalyst that propels life forward it is yes. it is that which precedes the awakenings. So it's what gives birth to new life and to the new evolved expression of myself. And so, so I use that, I use that, um, that metaphor also as a way to su support people in recognizing how we can move through life's labors in a way that is more gentle and um, uh, with less resistance. And so there's a lot of tools that we can cultivate along the way when we're not in the middle of the contraction in yeah. the labor. So that when we get there, we have our support system, we know how to breathe through it, how to surrender and to open, to allow, instead of being in resistance. We know as mothers, 
that when you're in resistance and during a literal labor, that it hinders the process of birth, of expansion, of evolution, of new life emerging. Yes, and so, it is that much more painful. Exactly. If I yeah. might add from my own personal experience. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, and allowing yourself to breathe through it. Well, on Dreamers Unite, I have shared, this Dreamers is the woman that I have talked about you. I don't know if I said it by your name. We had that conversation of giving birth to our dreams and our goals and our heart's desires. And it's that combination of pain and the joy, it's all wrapped up together mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. because as yeah. you said, and that when you action is necessary yes and when you when you become more awakened then you recognize the beauty and the contraction yes right like you just go into the beauty of it you're not in a state of resistance and judgment but you're recognizing as it's occurring that there is this perfection in that process. And so that's the beauty of awakening. It helps us to live our life with a deeper level of embodiment of the soul perspective. And so we're experiencing beauty. When I see through the eyes of my soul, everything is beautiful. Okay, everything. Let's, take a minute. let's take a minute. I wanna, okay, I wanna, yeah. I wanna take a minute to absorb that. And I want our viewers and our dreamers I want you to say that again. When we see through the eyes of our soul, everything is beautiful. It's seeking, seeing, and feeling beauty in everything, especially those things that we find unacceptable, especially. Because yeah. those are the things that are harder to see beauty in. It's easy for me to walk outside my garden and see beauty, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. But is it easy to see beauty in the child that is suffering, your own, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that is crying and in pain and suffering? Can you see the beauty there mm -hmm. when they're in the midst of their pain? And if you can, and this is what I've learned and this is what I bring to my healing practice, if I can see your wholeness when you are feeling broken, then you pick up on that frequency in me that's holding you as whole. Mm. holding you as whole instead of broken and so, and so that's a powerful kind of transmission of divine love and unconditional love that requires no condition to be present in order for love to be present right mm. and so often we are are unable to access love the feeling of love when we are witnessing something that is not acceptable to us. And I'm saying that in a gentle way because sometimes it's yeah. absolutely terrifying to us or abhorrent to us the things that we see in the world or in our lives at different points. And so how do we, how do we practice that ability to see and feel and embody love in the midst of suffering? in the midst of suffering and in the midst of our own judgment and our yeah. own expectation of yeah. what we think either our lives should be or our loved one's lives should be. Yeah. And what most of us do is we don't feel our pain. We actually, we stuff it, we think yes. it. Thinking yes. it is it's amazing how we think our pain. Um, it's like we go in a spiral. We the thoughts kind of take us somewhere. Whereas if you're feeling it, it's very quiet actually. It can be very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. But if you stay with it and you feel it, it moves. It doesn't, it, it doesn't stay stuck. But m many of us hold it, stuff it in such a way that it becomes a part of us in ways that we have no idea. You know, it might turn into a physical condition. Mm -hmm. It might turn into a life condition that we stay with and we have no idea that we're propelling it by not allowing ourselves to feel what's there. And so um, to be able to hold space for somebody, bear witness to their suffering or their pain and just hold space for it instead of trying to fix it. And then as the feeling comes, as you allow that person to feel it, 
then I can begin to use some of the vibrational healing tools to lift it, to shift it, to create a new pattern of thinking that allows them to have the freedom. Um, I mean, don't we all want freedom? Don't freedom from want freedom. Freedom from our own thinking. Our own thinking, which causes Our us suffering. Thinking. Yes, which causes yes. us suffering. Yes. We wage a war suffering. against what is all the time in our own mind. And and to me, what sacred activism is, is when I tend to my own thinking, my own feelings, mm -hmm. when I tend to my own awakening, when I go inside and make that connection and plug in, then I have the resources of the infinite source of all creation the divine field of love and support. I have resources that I don't have when I'm coming from my ego human consciousness. Yeah. And so when I access that, now I act from a place of creativity, love, peace. How can we create peace in the world when we have a war in our own mind? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's and how can you give love when you do not love yourself? Thank you. Because you can't pour from an empty cup or Thank from you. a cup that's half filled or a quarter filled. You're trying, then you're trying to give someone something that you don't even have enough of. Right. Yeah. That you don't have and enough. So when, when, we're, when we're in the half empty phase of the cup, <laughs> I always say that's the time to be in receptive mode. Yeah. You know, it's like, an, and there's it's a beautiful time when we empty then we have space for something new to come in. So I always like to make sure we don't villainize the empty cup <laughs> because that's the space in which we become the vessel of something new. That's right. And you know, so there's, there is a feeling of when we empty that there is a death that happens, but in order for birth to happen, there needs to be a dying to the old and allowing for something new to come in. And so, so we, we honor and celebrate both the empty and the full cups. When we're full, then it's just like over brimming, like just here we are, give, give, allow, you know, ourselves to be in a space of sharing everything that we've filled up with. Yes. Okay. There's so much I want to I know. <laughs> offer. Okay. So I was going to read a little passage from your book, but okay. I'm going to hold on that for a moment because this popped up for me as we're, we're talking about the uh, appreciating the empty and not villainizing it. Right. And, um, and, and continuing to give, give, give right from your overflow. Right. Which as a healer, that's what healers are doing, right? You're holding space. Mm -hmm. So how do you, uh, tend your own coffers. How do you replenish? So I have some spiritual practices that are a really important part of being able to hold space for others. And the, the probably the most important, the first and most important um, when I begin a day is my meditation practice. And and I think so many people are recognizing now the importance of meditation and mm -hmm. that can look different for everybody. Lately, sitting meditation every morning has been how I begin to make that connection, that interconnection. And then the practice of beauty that just came in in the last couple of days where, uh, and I've done that before, but this was really very clear to seek, feel, and see beauty in everything especially those things that it's hard for me to see it in. So that's another way that I begin to activate the frequency of my inner being. Because once I'm connected to that, I'm, I have infinite resource. There's no, there's, no, um, uh, there's no need for replenishment. It's constantly flowing. It's the abundance of that infinite self, that infinite source energy comes through when we're connected to our soul. So another practice is um, writing. And I do that every morning when I go into, I go into sacred prayer, into the Akashic field, and I receive guidance. And I'll ask questions. I'll, uh, most of it's a dialogue with me and, the, and source energy. 
and it's fascinating. It's just I get the most interesting information that comes through and that aligns me. And another one is painting. I, when I paint, I am, um, it, it's, a, it's an automatic plug in to my source. So I could feel that electricity coming through as soon as I start painting. And you have so those, your those, beautiful yeah. paintings behind you too. Your yes, house is filled with your beautiful work. Yes, yes. Talk a little bit about your journey as an artist. So I, I grew up in Canada and the Bahamas, and, but I was born in the U.S. And I went to high school in Nassau, Bahamas, and my mother was my art teacher at the high school that I went to there. That's how we made it down there. She got a job teaching art. And so I've lived around art my whole life, so I've heard that three, four, I was always into drawing and, you know, pasting and stuff when I was young. But when um, I was in the Bahamas, I really started to, to enter into a new phase of my creativity and my art. And I was surrounded by not only my mother as an artist, but she was a part of the arts community in the Bahamas and a lot of amazing artists there that influenced me quite a bit. But the big turning point for me as an artist was um, my first year of university in Canada, I went to visit my mother in um, Columbus, Ohio. She had moved back up there after I graduated. And she had easels and blank canvas set up in the studio, which was the kitchen <laughs> at her place. And she said to me, I want you to paint not using a reference. And in the past, she had asked me to do that. And I was absolutely adamantly no. I needed a reference. I needed that. That For me, that was a, a crutch um, to have a reference. And so that means what I mean is a picture or something from life. And so she said, no, I want you to paint without using a reference. And you were going to use a meditation method. You just meditate. And I want you to paint purely for the process, not for the end product. That was key. And to you would not have to show me the painting when it was done. And so I acquiesced. I was like, okay, I don't have to show you the painting. Those three hours were kind of my, one of my first huge awakenings. Um, I made conscious contact with my soul. That was it. I connected, I plugged in. And I call that painting Silent Scream. And it feels like I finally made contact with my inner voice. I had always been terrified of public speaking and kind of speaking up, even in small groups, it was like heart racing and head throbbing. And, and so this was like me finding, my soul finding a way to speak through me, through my art. And my art, as you can tell from the colors back here, is bold, it's wild, it's free, it's uh, full of untamed energy. And the divine feminine is a big part of my art. Um, embodiment of my art is very much part of the divine feminine. And so from that point forward, I could not paint the old safe way. Again, I was um, unleashed basically. And so my art from that point forward, just, uh, you know, it was, it became pretty wild. Um, my mother said sometimes when she'd come to visit me, I she would get in a migraine headache the first day, <laughs> taking in all of these paintings and all the color and intensity of it. But, um, but it's calmed down some. <laughs> I, you know, I have some of your pieces in my home. Yes, you do. Yes, and, and I absolutely, it awakens me and my mm. spirit and it speaks to my soul. Beautiful. Yeah. Well, I feel like the artwork, because of where it's coming from, in a way is a sacred transmission. Mm -hmm. So I feel that. because it carries the vibration of the sacred, then it's being transmitted when people are in the presence of it, whether, they, whether they're drawn to the visual expression of it or not. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's also what I do with my soul portraits. Um, and that's a part of what I do with the healing work is, um, I enter into my client's Akashic record and call in their soul and, 
and basically channel their soul on canvas. And that becomes a sacred transmission of their own divine self. And that's used as a healing tool for their awakening and their evolution. It's one of my favorite parts of the work that I do now. Yeah, I, okay, I want to, you've been referencing Akashic Records. And mm -hmm. for those dreamers, viewers, visionaries, um, people that are tuning in, um, please explain a little bit more about the Akashic Records, how you became involved, how you were led to do this type of healing work. Okay, so the Akashic Records, a lot of people are not familiar with that term. So I'm always explaining it. It's basically <laughs> a vibrational record of your soul's journey in all time and space. So it carries within, it's a frequency, and it carries the knowledge, the information, like in form, nation of your soul's journey. And as a, a Akashic Records healer, um, I access that information and I receive in different people who do this work receive in different ways. The way in which I receive information and guidance, insight for my clients and for myself is through clear cognizant, which is a knowing, like a like a, just a knowing, like it just kind of drops in and I'm aware of the information and I, I present it. And then clairsentience, which is feeling. It's a, uh, I can pick up things in my body. I can feel, if I'm with a client, I might be able to feel their throat starting to constrict. And I can feel it in my body and it gives me information. So I get information through my body. I'll, I, one time I'll, I was in a session with a client and I felt a uh, fluttering in my stomach. And it felt very, very similar to the very early phases of pregnancy. And that was the only thing I could think of. I kept looking down at my stomach thinking, what? Like I thought I'd be able to see it, you know, popping out of my stomach. And when I shared it with her, she immediately was able to tell me what that was about for her. It was, mm -hmm. it was about not being able to have, have a child. And so, and the trauma that that was carrying for her um, was something that we needed to work on in the session. So it just gives you a little idea of how that information can support us in the here and now. It's not about um, getting some kind of gratuitous information about a past life or something, although yeah. you can get information about past lives if it is pertinent and helpful to this time and space that you're moving through right now. It can help you to evolve and grow here and now. So, so that's, that's basically how we utilize it. It's, it's also that field of infinite possibility that you often hear spoken about in spiritual language. And um, so there is that element of infinite possibility, any possibility that might happen in the future. We are choosing that at a soul level, how things unfold. And so we can always know that we can choose the reality that is being expressed in our outside world. So what I'm doing is I, my work is about going into the formless, really tapping into that field that is formless. I, I, I like to call it the dark womb of creation because mm -hmm. we also have, we villainize the darkness and I love the darkness because that's the unseen mm -hmm. and that's where everything emerges. You know, the dark soil of the earth is where everything comes forth. Mm -hmm. That infinite field of, of the quantum field is where all of life emerges from, comes from thought, comes from thought That's form. Right. That's right. Yeah. So, and what I do in my healing sessions is I combine the Akashic records with flower essences. That's another part of my work, which is, which is a vibrational medicine that you take internally that works on the mental and emotional um, patterns that are blocking you from being in alignment with your soul. So it could be worry, excessive worry, fear, um, uh, judgment, being intolerant of another, things like that are different blocks that keep us from really feeling our sense of joy and freedom and peace. And so the flower essences are an incredible tool to transform 
your life experience. Like that's how I got started in the healing work. You live such a purposeful life and an intentional life. Um, how do you feel that you were called to do this type of work? Was it a calling? It was a contraction. Okay. It was my contraction that called me. <laughs> it okay. called me to, um, so I wanted relief from my own suffering. Mm -hmm. And so me, I worried so much. I wake up with panic attacks and it was taking over my life. And it, it was not necessarily even based on conditions needing to be present for the worry to be mm -hmm. there. It's, mm -hmm. you know, when conditions were there, it made it much worse. But um, a lot of that worry was directed towards my oldest son and some of the things that we moved through with him. But, um, but once I began to heal the, with the, with the flower essences, there's a flower essence for all of the, all of you out there who are worriers, it's called red chestnut. It's about flower essence. You can get it at the health food store. You know, these are all over the counter, um, natural, completely safe, um, vibrational medicine that you can take internally. And that began to shift that chronic worry. And once I noticed that I was not doing the same kind, I wasn't reacting the same way that I did before with my son, I was like, whoa, I have this ubiquitous worry for everyone, for humanity, for, you know, it was, <laughs> it was everywhere. Yeah. And then I became in touch with that quality in me. Once I got there, I was able to really start healing. When I started dealing with that core issue, which was, it's the issue that many empaths have where we feel and pick up the energy of everybody else. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a curse and a blessing. It's at the a same curse time. and a blessing. Yeah. And I've learned how to channel that as a blessing in my healing work rather than it being cursed. So now I can hold space for somebody without taking all of their stuff in. I know how to release it. You know, it doesn't become, it doesn't stick to me like Velcro. Anymore. Yes, yes, and become your baggage. In the beginning, it was definitely, I was still kind of taking it in their stuff and I was wanting to fix it and figure it out for them. And that that is not the journey of healing, to fix it for somebody else. Mm -hmm. It's about helping them to recognize the truth, which is that they are whole, that they are love, that they are infinite, eternal beings of light. Like yeah. when they learn who they are, it's, ugh, it's nothing like it. Do you still feel fear? And when you do, because let's face it, the fear of the unknown exists. It's part of our, our um, psyche. It's part mm -hmm. of what our brain does, right? As the survival mechanism to, oh, don't do that. You could get hurt. You have to survive. Oh, you better not do that. That could be harmful to you. You have to yeah. survive, right? So how do we retrain our thoughts, our thought patterns, our behavioral patterns? How do we um, have this new mindset and trying to control this beast between our ears? It is a beast. <laughs> it's a beast. It's not easy. Um, and we know the fact is the fear is going to come. This is what I want to say about that. I think that First, yes, I do still experience fear. Um, just like I still have contractions in life that keep giving birth to a new awakening in me. And so it's a journey that we're on and we came for the journey, not to just, you know, be the soulless, the, the soulless, the fearless soul self. Um, we, our souls wanted to be embodied into this human experience and it's full of texture and emotions and diversity in experiences and this is what we're, we're here for and so part of the human psyche is um a lot of the human psyche is based on fear the ego is is trying to protect us that's right you know making sure we don't walk through walls you know because the soul can <laughs> we're kind of always navigating that and so what i am noticing is that we've let the ego or the human consciousness take over to be in the driver's seat. And so the work that I'm doing is really helping us to regain our identity as divine beings. 
mm -hmm. as soul. And so when I am driving, when I'm the soul, when I'm, that's my identity, then, then I'm, it, the, the, the experience of fear just kind of is like a wave. It's like a contraction. It doesn't stay with me. And part one of the tools that I would say is to absolutely allow yourself to feel it when it comes. Mm -hmm. Don't try to run from it or spiritualize it away. It's there. If it's there, it's there for a reason. Listen to, listen to yourself. Listen to your inner being. Listen to your thought and then breathe. So I use tools, breathe and meditate, um, tapping on your sternum. If you have anxiety, this tapping is really good. Um, I do that with a lot of my clients. You can begin to feel something shift and you breathe deeply when you're tapping. Um, there's lots of tools out there for that. One of the, the best tools for me has been the flower essences, especially for chronic worry, but also for acute worry. During the beginning of the COVID um, crisis, as that started, my fear went way up. And so I pulled in all of my, my um, tools. I started taking a new bottle. I cre created a, a mixture of flower essence for myself. What I do is I blend different flower essences that are um, tapping in on the different feelings that I'm experiencing that are kind of blocking me from feeling peace. And so, um, so that's one of the things that I did, walking in nature, earthing, um, which is often called grounding. My guidance called it earthing for me because it's, it's not just walking in the earth barefoot, which is grounding, because you can actually begin to feel the electromagnetic field of the earth and it grounds us, it connects us. Um, earthing is also taking in the beauty of the earth, like really just bringing it in and moving myself away from the synthetic kind of um, already manifested conditions that are showing up that are causing, that are causal of, this, of the fear. So I don't watch the news. I um, only tap in when I know I need to get some information or I receive it from sources that I trust. And I, often jump off of social media when I notice myself kind of spiraling into fear. So yeah, I still experience it, but not in the chronic way that I used to. You know, I think for many of us, I want to say, and I've been there too, you wonder why, you know, I have a good life. I really don't have anything to complain about. I really don't. Even the toughest moments, there's some things that I could complain about, yeah. Sure. We can always find something to complain we about. Can. Yeah, and I'm certainly am not saying, look, I've gone through my fair share of tragedy. I definitely have trauma that I'm working through. Um, but it is knowing that it comes a time where you're responsible for yourself and your own healing and your own really joy. And I just have to make up my mind no matter what's happening, I want to choose joy and happiness. Now that doesn't mean we're going to walk through life happy every moment. Yeah, it doesn't. But what you said so beautifully is connecting, not running away from it, looking at it and seeing, okay, what am I supposed to learn from this? Yeah, How it's are you supposed it's, to grow you know, and expand and evolve. And just knowing, having faith that you will. And knowing and having faith that you will. Faith is a, a huge, important part of it's, the journey. It's part of the It's part of the birthing process. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're in the middle of giving labor, in a labor, giving birth to a literal birth, you at some deep level are having faith that, that this baby will come out and be okay. That's right. And, and if you didn't, I mean, I don't know what would happen to all of our bodies if we weren't <laughs> having faith. It's like something happens and we, we dive into or we surrender to this faith, even in the middle of, you know, it might take being in the middle of the contraction to say, I surrender. Um, but we can surrender before the labors of life. We can begin to surrender and live from that place. But I have faith that, that there is beauty 
happening right here and right now. And what you said, I think is really key, is that I have a choice on how I'm perceiving my experience. I have a choice. And that might be the only thing you have control over in that moment, is how I'm perceiving it and how I be in it, how, what frequency I am embodying while I'm moving through this moment, no matter what it is. Like, in what you embody, you emanate. What you embody, you emanate. So whatever's vibrating inside of you vibrates out from you. This is another form of sacred activism. When we are conscious about what we're embodying, then we emanate this powerful frequency. If we're not being conscious or intentional, we just let it happen by default, then we, we emanate that. Fear, worry, you know, despair, whatever that is. Feeling out of and control. So, yeah. Yeah. It's like, so, so what do we want to embody? What do we want to see out in that world? Oh my goodness. I didn't even get an opportunity to read from the book, but you're going to have to get the book dreamers for yourself. Um, <sighs> Becky. Okay. Because I want to take this last um, minute or so to ask you to finish a sentence for me. To complete okay. it. Um, and I'm really just going to um, kind of allow my spirit to kind of guide this question. Okay. I believe that the truth about me, no matter what other people see, I believe the truth about me is that I am divine love. I am an individuated, unique, distinct expression of the infinite source of all that is. And when I am aware of that, then I know that you are too. <sighs> I receive it. You know, I think that literally, I just let God and Spirit guide me for that question. Because I told you, I said, I'm going to have you fill in. I didn't yeah. know what it was going to be, but we didn't get a chance to um, talk about this. But I only, you know, yeah, not getting my face juicy with tears which is also a good thing, releasing, but yeah. not, you know, <laughs> not in my makeup. <laughs> um, Eventually, we will allow ourselves to be completely bare. Correct. Not bare with makeup anymore. Not right, right now. <laughs> bare yeah. our beauty. <laughs> yeah. Um, I want to just yeah, briefly that's touch on, okay. that's okay. I want to just, th th as you said, this divine love, knowing why is it so difficult for us to love ourselves. Why is it so difficult? We've forgotten because we who forgot. we are. Mm -hmm. And that that's part of the journey of being human is to forget mm -hmm. so that we get to remember. And what a delicious journey it is to remember again our brilliance and our beauty. And then to be able to help other people to remember. That's right. I think we're on this as a ride, you know? And so, so, one of, I'm going to leave this quote with you um, that a friend recently told me, and I didn't read it myself, so I'm paraphrasing, but it's, it's James Baldwin. And he said that when, when white people truly learn to love themselves, there will be no more racism. Yes. Yes. That's the power of self-love. It's yeah. radical. It's radical. If we can love ourselves, if we can really, and that to me is about aligning to love. Yeah. It's not, it's not a um, romantic or sentimental That's right. That's concept. Right. It's literally a it's radical right. act to love it's yourself right. and to be in alignment with love. And then you can't act from that love in a way that is harmful to another. That's right. You know, consciously or co unconsciously, when you're in that frequency, it's deep self-worth. It's a deep level of self-worth. And so when you're worthy, when you feel worthy, you will, 
life is transformed, not just for yourself, but for everybody around you. Yes. I am going to leave it there. When you feel worthy, life is transformed for yourself and for everyone around you. And the, and, and the world. It and ripples the, out that's into right. the body of humanity. Right. That's right. Mm -hmm. But we're all a part of this universe. We're all connected yes, we to everything and everyone. Whether we realize it or not, it is a ripple effect. We're automatically yeah. connected. Yeah. Becky, wow, what a beautiful journey that I've had the privilege to walk with you for quite some time. And um, it's even more of a privilege to just sit, as we do anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but now to be able to share this journey, not only with me, but with others who need it, who need it. Thank you, my dear, beautiful sister. And thank you for being a dreamer for us all. I feel so grateful to have you in my life. And um, I can't wait to see what emerges from this work that you're doing. Thank beautiful you. sacred activism. Oh, sacred activism, sacred yes. activism. Dreamers, let's just leave you with sacred activism. And also I'm going to ask that you kindly subscribe if you haven't done so yet. I'm not sure what you're waiting for, but if you are so led, please subscribe, hit the blue bell um, for more wonderful content and uplifting and inspiring content that we don't want you to miss. Becky, where can we find you? You can find me at www.beckyart.com, spelled B-E-K-I-A-R-T.com. Social media. Oh, social media, my name, Becky Crowell, B-E-K-I-C-R-O-W-E-L-L, -L, for Facebook, and Becky Art for Instagram. Please, if anybody wants to have a soul session or a soul portrait, um, read my book. I would love for you to share in this awakening journey with me and for me to, me to be able to serve you in revealing your fair beauty to you and to the rest of the world. Yes, Becky, I received it and I'm just gonna open my hands. I'm not gonna throw the nugget at you, you guys. I'm opening it as an offering, as an offering. Love yourself, awaken to your bare beauty, okay? Because now is the time, dreamers, to create the world we wish to see. I'll see you amen. next time. Yes, Ashe and amen. We'll see you again, dreamers. Bye.